Hello. We're here. We're back. Father, I ask you to bless our time together today. I ask you to bring in those who you would have be in this Bible study to be a part of what we're doing. I ask you to teach us more and more <clears throat> about who you are and who we are in you. And I thank you for that. I ask you to be with us now, Father, and, and um, enjoy the study with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Tina, your visitor number one. Yay. Hope you're feeling well. Okay. Um, we are in James 5.1. We started last time. And now we're in... Um, let's see, where are we? Page 120. Um, here. Come now, you rich... Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Hi, Gary. Jeez. Um, more, most likely... James was paraphrasing something he had heard Jesus say. And I'm going to be quoting a lot from other places to kind of back up what James is saying here. He's probably remembering this. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, you shall mourn and weep. Remember, the whole idea of, of having enough is okay. It's the whole idea of depending on that instead of God that becomes a problem for us. And one of the things that, <clears throat> that James was challenging here was that people had plenty. They just weren't sharing it with other people. So here, Jesus, in turn, when he, when he um, says that thing that is reported in Luke 6, is most likely alluding to something that Isaiah said to Israel on God's behalf. Thus said the Lord your God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you'll be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you will be ashamed. I guess we have to decide whose servants are we going to be. Are we going to be the Lord's servants? Are we going to serve the world or serve our money or serve our own flesh, or what What are we going to do? And how are we going to live? And we're either going to be servants to those things or servants to God. Now, why did God say this to the people of Israel? Out of Isaiah 65, 13. Because he had approached them and then later, he was, they were rejecting him as their provider and their protector. Let's go back to Isaiah 65, 1 to 3. 65, yeah, verses 1 through 3. Hi, Joe. How are you? This is God speaking. He says, I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way that is not good, 
according to their own thoughts, a people who provoke me to anger continually to my face, who sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on altars of brick. Hey, Liz. God reached out to them as he has to us. Some of us weren't seeking him. He, he found us. I wasn't seeking him. I was against him. And he found me. And he reaches out to us constantly. And he wants to be a provider. And he wants to be a protector. But they're doing the very same thing that we often do. They turn to something much less than God for provision and protection. He said, they said, he says, they sacrifice in gardens and they burn incense on altars of brick. What is that about? It has to do with worshiping false gods. James in 5 1 says, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. The word miseries, let me quote that verse again. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. The word miseries means afflictions and sufferings. God is not telling them he plans to torment him. He isn't going to cause the miseries that are coming upon them. He's simply telling them that he can see what's about to befall them and its miseries they set themselves up to experience by choosing false and unreliable gods. As James says, come now you rich, he is acknowledging that some to whom he is writing are wealthy in various ways. Remember last time we talked about wealth, not just our riches, not just being money, but I'll say, Lent. It's good to see you. Not just money, but also it could be our patience. It could be our hospitality. It could be our love. It could be our concern for others. It could be empathy or sympathy. But we hold it all to ourselves as if, as if we're hoarding these. As James says, come now, you rich, he's acknowledging that some to whom he is writing are wealthy in various ways, and that they tend to lean on those riches for their own security and not use them to serve God's kingdom or all the other people that God loves. However, when we use these this way, oops, they are false gods. And these will cost them a lot in the long run. And the cost is going to be their suffering. James encourages them to go ahead and weep and howl for your ministries, miseries, not ministries, (laughs) miseries that are coming upon you. They're fixing to come. The word weep means to wail. The word howl is from the sound produced when a person is crying aloud to false gods, um, praying, shouting, and shrieking. Um, it, was, it was a word. That was how they did their worship. They howled. And I find it instrument. They, they would shriek and make these guttural sounds. And if you've ever been around a person who is truly demonized, they'll make some of these sounds. They'll do that sometimes. I find it interesting that James chooses this word 
of all words. So appropriate. It says, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. The term coming upon you refers to the arrival of an unexpected season or one's destiny. In other words, if we bow at the altar of money, of financial security, or protection or provision of anything but God, we can expect a season of weeping and howling to eventually follow. God breaks false gods because they're not good for us. They hurt us. Now we move on to James 5.2. And it's good. It's good if you're hearing this Bible study and you're wondering what what is this about or if it's plucking at your heart and you don't know why. Ask the Lord to reveal to you what you trust instead of him. Some people are depending on other people's approval to be okay. It's another false god. It doesn't take much to turn public opinion around. Right now we're watching the left in our country who um, is attacking a lot of godly ideas and godly morals. And every week, I don't know if you pay attention to it in the news, but every week they eat one of their own. Another leftist person who, who believes in ultra-radical ideas says something that goes against the party line of the left, and they turn on them. They're consuming them. It's like they jump, they pile on. And the next thing you know, they're out of favor. And what I've been watching is some people who have been becoming more conservative as they realize that they used to tear other people apart for their beliefs and talk down to them. And now because they didn't tiptoe around all the topics of the month, you know, club, uh, now they're in disfavor and they're being eaten alive. And that's just the way it works. I believe that when, like if you do deliverance, and you begin to grapple with a demon that God wants someone to be free of, they'll sacrifice each other. And people that are under the sway of the demonic will do the very same thing. I think some of the beliefs in our country, a lot of the beliefs in our country in the mainstream Demonic beliefs, they come straight from the pit of hell and are communicated by demonic activity where they're carried and people have totally given their hearts over to this stuff. And when they're confronted, they do what demons do. They'll gnash their teeth. They'll have guttural sounds. I mean, we watch people because someone was elected that people didn't like howl just like that they worship false gods, the guttural howls. Why? They did the same thing when the Supreme Court basically made a decision that the way they were interpreting the law was incorrect and they put the power to limit abortion back in the hands of the states. And the pro-abortion people worshiping Moloch by killing babies began to howl in worship of their God. It's all around us if we'll keep our eyes open and look at it. James 5 1. Come now, come now, you rich. Those of you hoarding your riches, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. It's it's gonna happen because our gods, if they're not God, they're false. He says in James 5.2, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Now the Greek word translated as corrupted isn't used anywhere else in the New Testament. This is a verb which refers to active rotting. 
R-O-T-T-I-N-G, rotting. He says, your riches are rotting. And when I read that, it just struck a chord with me, and I went looking, and it reminded me of manna in the wilderness, which when not consumed would rot when it was hoarded. It would it would begin to, to mold and rot and fall apart, and it was no longer useful for nutrition. Your riches are actively rotting. So on, so we'll look at Exodus because I, I referred to the idea. Well, here. Well, here's that idea, and then I'll go back. They did not listen to Moses. Moses said what God said to do. Go pick up all the bread and eat it. Eat the quail that was falling. Some left the supply of it until morning and their bread worms and became foul and rotten. And Moses was angry with them. Why? Because God had provided and then they wasted it by not being obedient. And I want to tell you, good spiritual leaders to this day grieve over spiritual waste. Now, when James 5, 2, when, when he said your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten, there's a good chance that, G, that James was remembering something that Jesus had said. In this sentence, James uses two different in, images to convey the truth that hoarding any riches even if there are things like our time or our energy, is a huge waste of resources God allowed us to have so that we can utilize them. Most likely he was thinking of this that Jesus said. Do not lay yourselves, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven when neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now let's think about it. If we have time and someone needs something done or we have energy and we just hoard it, we're wasting an opportunity to meet a need, to love our brother and sister in Christ, or someone who's outside of Christ who needs to see the love of the Lord. And what do we gain from it? Nothing. Whatever we were to spend just sits there. It's not being utilized. What about finances? What about spare food we have laying around? What about extra clothes we have that we're not going to wear? I knew somebody that had an entire room full of clothing and all the labels were still on it. I don't know what poverty mentality it came out of or how much loss went into causing that. That person was filthy rich with clothing and it was just sitting there getting dry run. It was wasted. It was treasures on the earth that were just falling apart. Your riches are rotting. The term your garments are moth-eaten pretty much means the same thing. We ought to share what we have and not waste it. It's not it's just going to rot and age like everything else does because the fallen man brought an entropy. In verse 3, James says, I know this doesn't sound uplifting, but it's an encouraging letter. It's encouraging people to live like they're designed in Christ. 
In verse 3, James says this, Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you. And it's going to eat your flesh like fire. You've heaped up treasure in the last days. So when we get to verse 4, we're going to see that James is aware of how the world works. Some are so greedy that not only do they hoard their stuff and their gifts and their talents, but they cheat others out of honest wages. And I've actually seen church leaders do this, making contracts with businessmen and reneging on promises or even outright lying and saying they never made the promises in the first place. I've had them look people in the eyes knowing that that they did make a contract or they did make a promise. And look, we live in North Texas where people still make business deals on a handshake. And they'll look them in the eye and say, I never said that. It's outright lying. And James 5, 4 is going to assure us that God sees all this. So, so if you make it, if you mess somebody over, I almost said a, an unkind word. If you mess somebody over in a business deal in hopes of advancing your spiritual enterprise, which is supposed to be in the name of Jesus, who stands for truth and integrity and holiness and purity and all that is right, and the Lord sees it. Do you really expect he's going to bless you? Bless you? No, it's going to bite you. God's not going to take that. It says your gold and silver are corroded. The King James renders that when he says corroded, it's the word cankered. And this is another Greek word translated to canker or in the New King James as corroded which is used nowhere else in the New Testament. And, you know, stuff like that is a, is a, a signal. It signals something. It signals that we're looking at a unique situation. If there are two words in close proximity like that, they never get used anywhere else in all of the New Testament. It means rusty or tarnished, from not being used. In other words, looking at it, another can tell that it's been hoarded. Have you ever, do you have any coins that you saved that are hidden away someplace? If you carry them in your pocket, they're constantly moving around something else. I'm digging around in my old guy pocket to find something. This is a modern day quarter. I swear, I think they're shrinking. Um, well, it's shiny. It's shiny because people touch it. It's smooth because it rubs against other things in our pockets as we move. But what happens when you take a coin and you put it in a drawer or in a safe? They actually corrode. They get pitted. They don't have to be buried in the dirt to do that. They do. The acids in the air or whatever it is, um, corrode them. Um, these are actually protected by our oils of our skin. He says your gold and silver are corroded, cankered. They're rusty or tarnished from not being used. In other words, someone can look at it and tell it's been hoarded. It hasn't been utilized. I mean, it's not, you haven't done what money is there to do with, you know. That's why James says this next. He says that corrosion will be a witness against you. Isn't it interesting that the same word for witness can refer to a good witness or a bad witness? The thing about all this is that it hurts not only those God would have us bless but it also hurts us when we hoard our riches. 
The term their corrosion will eat your flesh like fire doesn't refer to our skin being eaten up like it was on fire. Rather, it has to do with the way it hurts our hearts. It hurts our flesh. It refers to flesh, which is the opposite of living by direction of the spirit. The, it says the mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. So in this verse, in verse 5, he said, 5, 3, he says, you've heaped up treasure in the last days. Now this is done to the detriment of other people who live honestly. And this, this reminds me of a passage in Romans chapter 2 in which Paul addresses the very same idea. And the reason that I do this is to show that throughout the scriptures, the same ideas get addressed by the same Holy Spirit through various writers of the New Testament and often in the Old Testament. It's important for us to see the common threads of the things that God is concerned about. It's important that we see it. Because it's important to the Lord that we see it. And I appreciate those who have come in and said hello when you come in. So this is a real long passage. It's uh, Romans 2, verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to walk us through it. He says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, Whoever you you are to judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. He's making a point that we judge people about what we're most aware of, and what we're most aware of is what we're doing wrong. So so whatever you judge, you condemn yourself. Have you noticed? that people who falsely accuse you of lying are often people who lie habitually, or people who accuse you of stealing or cheating, or people who habitually steal or cheat, or people that that accuse you of being neglectful, or generally spiritually neglectful people themselves. They're accusing you of what they're guilty of. That's the fastest way for me to know that a person is a liar is for them to accuse me of lying when I'm not lying. He says, We know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do not think this, O man, you who judge those practicing those things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God. Or do you just despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? This is a rich section in Romans 2. He says, but in in accordance with the hardness and in your impenitent heart, in other words, a heart that doesn't, feel bad about what it's doing wrong. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the eternal, of the righteous judgment of God who will render each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking, And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man 
who does evil. Of the Jew first, and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for as there is no partiality with God. Romans 2, 1 to 11. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Satan has done a masterful job of getting people, even believers, even people who have lived the Christian lifestyle, to be so focused on the things of the earth, the approval of or the fear of people, and so on, that will often cease to function as eternal spiritual beings at all. And that hurts all mankind and it grieves the Lord. So Paul, uh, James is talking about um, Christians who hoard things. Now he goes on and talks about people who, who actually not only hoard, but have ripped other people off in business deals. Well, they've given their word. He says, indeed, the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth. Now, this is an interesting image, and I just want people to pay attention if you've lost anything because of someone else's sin. Someone has stolen from you or cheated you out of things or um, got, and seemingly got away with it. It's important to be thinking about what I'm about to share because it's a beautiful sign of something that God has built into this whole system that we call our lives. Is anybody here? Nobody's responding, so I don't know if you're here or not. This is an interesting image. James says that the wages with the, which the workers are cheated out of actually cry out on their behalf. And that's the Greek word Kratzo, K-R-A-Z-O, which means as it's used here. Okay, thank you all for letting me know you can hear. Because Facebook's got it so that I can't really gauge that. And, and I'd like to know if I'm... There's been other times when I've been sitting here talking to me. And um, I do that enough on my own. Um, it's the word, the word for cry out is the Greek word kratzo, which means to scream a croak out a prayer to God when we're so much in pain. So think about that. Indeed, the wagers which you kept back by fraud cry out. That even when someone, what someone cheats you out of literally becomes a prayer to God about what you lost and that happens before you cry out to God and say, look what's happening to me. Or God, help me. Or anything like that. What we lost, I think this is so beautiful. Cry out on our behalf. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. Isn't that beautiful? So if you had respond, if you had an opportunity and someone else stole it, or you had a vehicle and someone else stole it, or you had a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or wife and somebody else stole that person, if someone in your life took their own life, and that was and that meant you lost something that was stolen from you. What was stolen cried out to God on your behalf. Says so right here in James 5.4. Think about that. 
Even when someone cheats you, what someone cheats you out of becomes a prayer to God about what you lost. This means when that boss or pastor took your ideas and said they were his ideas, the recognition you lost became a prayer to God on your behalf. Wow. I one time did an entire conference. Took a Friday night and all day Saturday to do this conference. And about three weeks later, the leader of that congregation preached my material as if it was his and was telling the, the people, many of whom who were there, and they weren't thinking about what they were hearing, that this was revelation God gave that person personally. And I was sitting in the audience listening to this guy steal my material, which really doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. But that loss cried out to God. Now, I don't particularly need um, credit for everything like that. But it just to know that God was listening to my my loss cry out on my behalf. Anyway, I think that's beautiful. That's not all that James says. Then when the cheated ones cry out for justice or cry out in frustration or in pain or in anguish, those cries are also heard by God. And it's interesting, just when we read the scriptures, think about why someone uses a certain term. It's interesting that James uses this term to refer to the God who heard the cries of what we lost and hears our cries. He, he used the term the Lord of Sabaoth. And the word Sabaoth, Sabaoth, I actually put the phonetic thing on there and still mispronounced it. Literally means armies or military hosts. And that term hosts refers to the angels which surround the throne of God. It's a warring term. You can find this in First King. I'll, I'll just, I'll just um, paste that whole paragraph. So in case anybody wants to look up these scriptures, they can. First Kings 22:19, Second Chronicles 18:18, 18, 18, Psalm 103, 21, all talk about the Lord of hosts, or if you look at the Hebrew words, the Lord of Sabaoth. By using the term the Lord of Sabaoth, James is implying that God is ready to utilize all those angels to vindicate you. This is the experience of a person who not trusting God and cheating God, people out of their wages is risking when he does that to God's people. That's the risk we take when we rip somebody else off. It reminds me of this scripture out of Matthew 25, verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, to one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus is that king. And he doesn't take kindly to greediness and dishonesty because it hurts the people who are cheated and it hurts the cheaters. How are we doing so far? The next verse, James 5, 5. 
He says, you've lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. I find it interesting that James makes it a point to start this sentence by emphasizing that they're living like this on the earth. It seems to me that the closer one comes to, becomes to the Lord, the greater the distinction between the earthly and the heavenly. The, the closer we become to the Lord, the greater the distinction between the earthly and the heavenly. And I believe with all my heart that if you want to become really close to the Lord, lean on him, depend on him, trust in the Lord and not on our own selves or anything else of the earth. Why trust what he made when you can trust the maker? It's, James is saying, this is how you spent your time and money, gained at the expense of others, making sure you had pleasure and luxury. The word pleasure means what we know it to mean. The word translated as luxury is a Greek word which means self-indulgent. Self-indulgent people are usually only interested in one thing, themselves. And this is the polar opposite of the Christian lifestyle Jesus modeled for us and commanded us to live. Live God with all your heart, body, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Selfishness, being self-indulgent, seeking luxury is the complete opposite of that. Now, I, I think it's great that people have nice cars and nice houses and bed sheets with high linen thread counts and all that kind of junk, but not to the detriment of other people. We're not taking any of this stuff with us. You know? So Pharaoh gets buried with all kind of riches in his coffin or whatever, and then he rots away. He goes to hell. None of that stuff makes the trip. We either go to heaven or hell, but either way, none of it makes the trip. God doesn't need any of earthly stuff in heaven, and we certainly won't need it. The second half of the sentence tells us something very sobering. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. I think we're going to stop here. And we're going to pick up at that middle verse. At the end of verse 5. Because there's enough there that I think will go way over time if we do it today. So um, I'm going to do it next time. I appreciate you being here. I've always, I always enjoy it and am honored that you would be a part of, um, of this Bible study. I want to say a word about honor. I, I got to uh, honor a friend's wishes this weekend. Uh, he, was, he was in a foreign country, couldn't be back because of COVID restrictions um, in time for his own dad's funeral. And uh, he gave me something to read on his behalf. I, I, I just want to say something about honoring. Um, he honored his dad by writing this. He honored me by picking me, of all people, to read this at a church building in town here. Um, I honored him by doing it. If you watched it happen, I didn't add anything to what he said because that would have dishonored what he did. There's a whole world of people that look like they've made it their hard cry to dishonor other people, institutions, important ideas, 
Honor's falling by the wayside. But we are honorable people. Let's take the time to honor what is honorable. Let's take the time to recognize when someone does something correctly and say something about it. Very innocuous way. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. Just to recognize, I appreciate what you did there. And, and that, that's an important thing because the whole world is trying to tear people apart. And we have a chance to balance some of that out. And in a world full of hatred and distance and disrespect, it really makes a difference. It really does. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this Bible study. I thank you that there are people who come to be a part of it uh, every week or as often as they can and, and that they spend the time listening and reading along and, and learning about what you would have us to know. I thank you for that. I ask you to bless us, Father, by showing us how to put this stuff to work in our everyday lives. I ask you to bless those who come. I ask you to bless those who watch this later on Facebook or on YouTube or however it is they see it. And I ask you to sink the truth of what we talked about deep in our hearts. And I ask you to filter away anything I was incorrect about. I ask you to bless us, Father, with good health. I ask you to bless our uh, comings and goings. And I ask that you give us the plans that you would have for us. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This video will be loaded up later on this website, which is my my uh, website. There's also our, all these articles. Uh, for those who follow what I do, I'll be speaking this Sunday at a local congregation, Hope Church. You can just look them up here on Facebook. They're in uh, Rome, Texas, and I'll be speaking. I, I think I know what I'll be talking about. But um, I started today thinking I knew, and now I have a different topic. So I've been asking the Lord's um, opinion about what he would have me speak about. And I just think this is an equipping time where the body of Christ needs equipping. I know that congregation, the minister there is the guy I watch over, and I know they do a good job, him and the elders, of equipping their folks that that uh, attend there. Um, so I intend to do the same thing. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. God bless you. I'll see you next time. In Jesus' name, amen.